the weather. So we start now normally with the, the user talk. So the, the first speaker is Daniel Gersberg, and he will talk on probing uh, uh, law violations with combined analysis on test magic and very fast observation. Daniel, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Um, so let me start. So, well, actually, this talk will be a bit more than just that. I was contacted a few days ago by Tomislav and the Ganzi Committee, uh, Tomislav, one of the co authors of this study, uh, to, the idea was to give a bit more details on how we do this experimental measurement uh, so that you can well, uh, learn from what we do and, and, and ask as many questions as you want. So, that I will report on this result, but I will also try to provide a lot of insight of how we do it step by step. So, well, this talk is on behalf of uh, all these people. Uh, I think more than half of them are, are here, so you can quest, uh, ask questions to any of us at any given point. Uh, let me start. Uh, I don't need to explain this in much detail. It's just to recall what uh, what we are using uh, as formulas in, in our study. Uh, well, this is the modified energy expression relation that we are using. And well, we focus in the linear and quadratic scenario, of course, n equal one and n equal two, because uh, this is the only one that we can probe efficiently, let's say. And uh, we, what we do is that we modify the time. I will come back to this a bit later with this uh, eta parameter that encompass the, the, the LID induced delay, and that is energy dependent. And well, here you can find the formula. Uh, the most important thing is this uh, to notice is this last term, which is this model dependent uh, distance. And actually, in this study, for the first time, at least for Cherenkov telescope, we are going to look at two of them. The one that we usually use is this, let's say, LIV uh, modelization uh, by Jacob and Tiran. And the other one is uh, DSR, which was, to my knowledge, never tested with uh, Cherenkov telescope, at least not by ourselves. And uh, well, here are the three. Ooh, it's wet. <laughs> I am barefoot because I'm. <laughs> My socks and shoes are drying somewhere. Um, I would not fool. These are the three experiment, uh, the free chunk of telescope experiment that uh, we are trying to combine in this study uh, S magic and Veritas, the, the actual uh, chunk of the operating nowadays. Uh, the classical energy range goes from 20 GV to 100 TV, more or less. Uh, this lower threshold depends on conditions, and same goes for the higher threshold, depends a bit of how. Uh, how you, you 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 observe your targets, and the idea of this project is to well improve our on live search, uh, well limits in this case, but uh, hopefully some signal one day. And the idea is to do that by increasing statistics by combining uh, all available data from this uh, telescope. The, you are data, you are you are more sensitive. This is as basic as this, and. Well, the, the idea behind the combination, let's say the, the plus that we get from this combination is that when you combine different source and more importantly, different type of source, you are uh, exposed to different kind of intrinsic delays and as well as different redshift, which means that this LIV effect, that is a propagation effect, should be more easily uh, disentangled from any intrinsic effect, which could spook uh, our results or sensitivity. And well, here is a classical list of astronomical sources that we use uh, for this kind of study: uh, SGNs, pulsars, and GRPs. And you have that nice uh, introduction of those. Uh, well, the exact list of uh, sources that we use for this project is this one. We have three AGN flare: uh, Markarian PK twenty one fifty five, PG fifteen fifty three, observed by Magic and S already. Uh, well, okay, this uh, this is clearly a typo. This is not twenty twenty one. This is twenty twelve probably one and two meters. And uh, we have pulsars, the car pulsars, which is kind of the standard candle, uh, well, the nebulizer standard candle of uh, our, our field. And the, the pulsar is what's inside. And it's well detected by uh, Cherenkov telescope. And we have an analyzed anal analysis by Magic and Veritas. And we have developed pulsar analyzed by S. And we have one GRB. Uh, well, we have actually more than one GRB detected by uh, Cherenkov telescope, but only one so far analyzed um, uh, by Magic. And this is the one we, we use here in this, in this combination. And now comes usually the analysis part, where I would show you the likelihood and tell you that we do an unbeaten likelihood analysis. And I would stop here. And here is now the time I'll try to go much more in depth to explain you what, what, what we are actually doing. The first thing I want you to notice is that this likelihood is a product on all the events in what we call the on region. The on region is the, in a region in the sky that contains the signal. 
So this is everything you expect to be signal, but you, you are not sure if it's only signal. We have a lot of background uh, when we do this kind of measurement. Depends on the source, the quantity of background, but it's quite very rare to, to have clean signal. And even a clean signal, you could, let's say, decide to take into account the background because it's very few, but it will still be there. It doesn't exist uh, the clean observation without background. So what we do is that we have two PDF, one for the signal, one for the background, and we have some probability, some ratio uh, to assign to both of them. And the, well, I'll come back to the PDF in a second, but let me start with these probabilities. Of course, they, they should sum to one. And the idea is that since you do your product on all the on events, you divide by the number of on events. And here you have in this for the signal S, you get the number of on events minus the number of off events, which will be a control background region where you will evaluate how many of these uh, let's say background events you get in your signal region. And you have some alpha parameter here, some ratio, and the background probability is just the, the reverse of this one. And I want to explain you a bit more what is this alpha parameter that, uh, that, that we get here. This is something that, like depends on your experimental condition, the way you observe the source. So for this, I need to go slightly back to the actually the imaging atmospheric chunk of uh, technique. Uh, that give the name to the uh, ICT acronyms. So we have these gamma rays that we observe, they enter the atmosphere, they will interact at the top of the atmosphere, they will create this cascade of particles, usually ten of thousands, depends on the energy of course. And these charged particles in the atmosphere that go faster than light in the air, they will they will emit a chunk of light, this bluish ultraviolet light that is usually for in our energy it's around TV uh, illuminate on the on the ground some surface of let's say cycle of radius 100 meters more or less and this this blue light is the one that you 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 catch with the the telescope and then the telescope gives you this kind of nice elliptical shape that is just let's say a side projection of this uh, shower development in in the atmosphere that's for one telescope and when you try to put two telescopes you get two angles uh, two views of this same shower which we call, and then we can do what we call still telescopic reconstruction so you get two of these nice ellipses in your field of view and then you can look at the shower axis the, the main one the long one which is this this axis the vertical one along which the, the shower develops and their intersection tells you where the source where this event come from so where is the source and you do this for many events. You cannot do it for only one event. You, you need a bunch of events, and then you get this kind of, uh, well, more detailed view. So you get like one, one shower, the second shower, and they intersect here. And the idea when we do this kind of observation is this is the camera center. This is still the field of view of the camera. It's just much more zoom. You have the camera center, and this is where we have the most efficiency in our observation. But this is not where we observe that we always use what we call the wobble observation mode. So there is a shift between the camera center and where we expect the source. You know, for instance, the known one, like the the, the, crab, uh, the crab pulsar will never observe it at the center, we'll observe it shifted, and we will get what, all these events, and they will accumulate now. If, if, if there is really a source, all, all you will get more events and get many images, and they will accumulate in this region, and you should have less events far from the expected source position. And the idea behind this shift here, with that we call the wobble, is this one. The, the camera is not uniform. There is our camera, they have some acceptance. I will come back to this in a minute. They, they do not, let's say, detect uh, with similar efficiency all the events in ev everywhere. There is some uh, radial dependence on this, on this, uh, on this axis on how you detect your, your events. So the idea is that if you, if you point here, to your source, you will get the maximum efficiency, but then you have no way to know your background region. Well, there are ways, but they are very time consuming and not efficient. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that the people came with, with well, already 30 years ago, and probably not related only to chunk of astronomy, is that you point slightly offsets. And so this is where you expect the, the source, the on region, and then you can evaluate in a symmetrical region uh, the off, uh, the background. So did this, in this source, you don't expect any signal. So what, what you will get is basically a measurement of your actual background. And you can subtract it from where you expect the signal. And if you see a significant difference, then that's your source. And the idea is that since both these regions are symmetric, they, they have similar acceptance, which is only toward the first of, of the uh, approximation uh, or because of this radial dependence of the, of the effect, uh, effective uh, uh, acceptance of, the, of our detector. 
the well, why do I say it's only a first order approximation is because well, actually there is more dependence. Uh, for instance, you can get uh, one on the geomagnetic field. The lower the energy of the shower, the, the more it will be affected by the geomagnetic field of the Earth, and you will have some effect that will affect all of these things. But okay, first order approximation, you could subtract. And of course, it's not the only way to evaluate your background. Sometimes you have, like, if it's a very, like a GRB, very short and strong observation, you will have very few events uh, in, in, in this region. So you have, like, a bad estimation of your background, and to increase, to have a more reliable uh, a description of the background, you can use this kind of technique. There's actually a bunch of them where you could use multiple of, and then you, you increase the statistics there. So you have a better control of how many events you have there. And this is what alpha is going to give you. Though I was talking a few minutes ago. This alpha is actually the ratio between this, well, first order approximation is just the geometrical ratio between these two, uh, these, these two region, the on region and the off region. The off region is usually at, at least the same size as the own region and usually larger to, to have a better estimation. And, uh, and well, first order of approximation is this geometrical ratio, but like I said, there is all this over second order approximation uh, that we need to take into account to, to properly describe the camera and that enters this, this factor. And this is how, let me go back slightly, you get a precise evaluation of this alpha factor and then this is how in your signal region you, you can, let's say, confidently subtract what's the actual number of, of events you get there. So now moving to the second part of this likelihood, you get this PDF, this uh, polity density function for, for signal. And there is many terms in this equation, so I, I will go one by one. And I want to do this with an example, a completely artificial uh, simulated example of a, of a flare that, so you can see this is the axis in time in seconds, and you can see some kind of Gaussian shape. This is like a, like a simulated Gaussian flare of a few hundred of seconds, maybe 1,000 seconds or a few hundred. So you get this, this is actually the light curve. So this is this F. This is the actual light curve of your observed so data. So at the beginning, you don't see any, any source. Your source is not visible. Then you get some signal. And you know the time pass, and you have like a stronger signal. And then time pass, and signal starts to fade. And then you don't get that any more signal. That's the time axis. And that's this guy by this formula. And of course, here, uh, when you will do it, at the end, you will do the likelihood analysis. You, you, you include the LIV parameter, which is the one you want to constrain. And on this vertical axis, you get the energy spectrum. Here it's a simple power law. This is why it's always uh, the same. The simple energy power law on, the, on this axis. And you get this kind of 2D template from these two functions. And here the, the color scale just gives you the, let's say, the expected intensity of each of these, of these pins. So of course, you expect most of your signal at low energy. There is always uh, more lower energy events than high energy events. And you expect them like centered on the on the peak of the flare, no? this, this, the central of the Gaussian here is the peak of the flare, where you get maximum uh, flux. And now you need to take into account uh, many things that are instrument, and different, instrument dependent. The first of these things is the effective area. This is, again, a toy one. A real one will be a bit more smooth, and but you always have this kind of rise and then a plateau. And at some point, it stops. The idea is that your instruments cannot detect some events below some energy threshold. Then you, you reach the threshold and you start to detect events, and there is a steep rise. And this is like very characteristic from Chankov telescope steep rise in the in this effective area. And you reach this plateau where you get, like, let's say, the nominal uh, performance of your instruments. And then after you go to higher, higher energies, and you decide to reach two high energies, and you saturate your camera. And, well, and for many reasons, you, you don't see anymore the, the showers there. And so, what you do is you need to convolve this thing with the previous template. And this is what you get because you, there is some some edges, some threshold. You, you lose the lower and the higher energy events. And the last term you need to combine is the energy migration matrix. This is this kind of plot where you can see the, the true energy versus the reconstructed energy. And this is also a feature of our detector. We don't reconstruct perfectly the, the energy for obvious reasons. We, we don't know it. The only thing we can do is estimate it. So we have Monte Carlo simulations that we generate with some known energy, and then we process them through the simulation. Simulation does everything, atmospheric, shower development, and then instrument uh, uh, detection. So there is 
um, everything, like uh, does the photon reflect on the mirror or is it reflecting inside the camera or outside? Is it the inside the camera? Does the photomultiplier quantum efficiency allow me to detect this one or, or not? All these things. And this gives you some spread. And then you apply your regular uh, reconstruction analysis to evaluate, to estimate the energy of the of the event, and you get something different than the, than the true energy. I mean, if if it, if we'd have been a perfect analysis and perfect instruments, this line would be perfectly straight, but it, it's not. So we get this kind of uh, spread. And uh, in general, at low energy, the spread is larger, and higher energy, it's, it's less. And this you need to take into account in, in when you when you do your analysis, and in particular LIV, because you know. Time and energy are, are connected, and well, energy is not perfectly described. And you take this into account simply by convolving this in, with your template. So you convolve these two things, and, like, and this will blur this this picture like this. This is what happens. So you recover before you had lost some events uh, at the extremities, and now because of this blur effect, because of the migration matrix, you recover some events above, below, and well, actually, this if, if you had like really good eyes, you could see it's slightly blurred. Yes. What is, what is what? The the F this one. Light curve. This is the, the light curve. So the flux dip with time. So this one that enters the the PDF. It's uh well. It's the the observed is only the the actual events and this is like a function describing the evolution of your flare so for instance the grv would be a simple poor law uh, let's say uh, the most simple uh, flare from an agent you would describe it with a gaussian but you have you have some room there you 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 can choose the, the function uh, well we usually choose the simplest one that describes the, the data and then Okay, so this is the this is the total signal PDF, let's say, before evaluating it. Yes. Yes, it, it's a typo. <laughs> Thank, thanks for noticing. <laughs> yes, good, 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 uh, good point. Yes. Uh, more questions? Oh. Okay, I go ahead. So, and now same for the background and your background, you expect absolutely no LIV structure. And so you have this kind of flat template. So this in energy is simply a polo and in time completely flat, absolutely no structure. And you, you will do exactly the same. You will convolve it with your effective area. You will get a slightly different shape. Then you will convolve it with your energy migration matrix and you will get again, another shape. And once you have to do this for signal and background, you can simply sum them, taking into account this probability that I just described, and you get this, let's say, total PDF for your own region. So this includes the signal part, the background part, and you get this nice thing, and this is your total probability function, and this is what you are going to, to evaluate in your unbeaten likelihood. And so, sorry, this was my first example based on this, let's say, uh, toy simulated uh, Gaussian player. And I would like to show you a second example to really show you what does the likelihood actually actually does. And I have this uh, example on JAV 1901-14C. And well, here the idea is that this is what magic measures, the simple polo, extremely boring, but thanks to our uh, friends from, uh, let's say, over wavelength, uh, we get over observations and theoreticians were able to simulate, uh, to not simulate, sorry, uh, reproduce, uh, and fit the, the, the light curve of this GRB. And this is what the model predicts, uh, well, based on all these fits at lower energies for TV energies. And so you, you see all this part where magic didn't observe, sadly. And you see where here yeah, where magic uh, observed. And so I want to show you now this kind of plot. So let me explain again. So this is eta. This is simply the parameter encompassing this LIV delay. Uh, and well, you can see here the uh, other fact that for the for the GRB. But what I would like you to 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 check is this, so the dotted line here is the actual polo measured by by magic, and here these four color codes uh, show what does the actual PDF looks like for different energies when taking into account this delay. So of course, the lower the energy, the smaller the effect. So the red line here is the closest to the dotted line, and then you increase the energy up to two TV which is the largest uh, energy observed for this GRB. 
and you get this blue line where you see really an effect. No, the, the, the expected PDF at this energy is different from the one measured by, by magic. And so what you can do now, I'm going to vary now this eta parameter, and you will see, I will, first you will get closer to zero, then above zero. And you will clearly see, I mean, what does the likelihood do? So the likelihood just simply shift this eta parameter and trying to find the best one. And now we are going to shift it by n to try to see what's going on. And so if I start to increase, you see the curve gets closer and closer because eta reduces. So the, the curve gets closer and closer to the actual measured one, the one with absolutely no delay. And you get this, well, at zero, they perfectly overlap for all the energy because there is no more LIV, no? Eta zero means no delay. And then if I start to increase eta again, you see slight difference appearing in the other direction. And if I keep increasing eta, then you see the feature of this light curve that was uh, well, uh, produced by our multi-wavelength partners entering. And the higher the energy and the higher the eta, the, the, the more prominent this feature is. And here you can already see by eye that this can clearly be excluded by what magic measurement, no? the, the magic measurements, they were those, those points. And clearly there is no structure in the, well, here it's been. So it's, it's kind of tricky, it's just to show you what the actual light curve looks like. But well, even if you look at the unbin analysis, you, you don't see this kind of structure for the highest energy events. So this kind of, let's say, LIV parameter is already excluded. And this is how you can constrain the, the, the delay and, and because of that constrain LIV. And yes, I want to uh, emphasize this fact that this is just a bin representation, but the actual likelihood is an bin, so it runs on all the events, meaning it, it really this products, no? You, you, you run this, this analysis on all the events in the own region. And I think this, this closed my, let's say, parenthesis on uh, giving details. Uh, you can ask questions now or later, no problem. And now we'll continue with the, with the actual, let's say, the, the rest of the analysis. So this effective area and negation matrix that I, I just showed you, that's what we call both of them when you when you put them together, that we call the instrument response functions because they describe how basically your detector uh, reacts to, to to some events and you know how many you lose, how many you get, and all these things depending of all the observation conditions. And so what we do in this project with S Magic and Veritas uh, is to well we take, we get the the IRF of each of these sources that I listed at the beginning observed by S Magic and Veritas. And then from this IRF, you can actually uh, accurately simulate all of these sources. And well, the first step of this project is the one we report here, mm -hmm. is this simulation of sources, and we try to test and validate the method uh, with, with simulations. So using this IRF, we simulate the sources, and we perform this join and bin maximum likelihood analysis. And well, join meaning that we have all the sources in the same analysis, so this likelihood is just uh, you sum it for every source. This sum of likelihood, not nothing tricky there. And so the way we do that is that we use low energy photons to build uh, the template, the, the function that you were uh, uh, asking for in, in general. We use it to fit because we assume there is no LIV delay here. And if there is a LIV delay, it's much, much smaller than what we get at high energy. So anyway, we can neglect it. And we use the remaining high energy photons, the one that, the one that should be most affected by LIV, and to perform this, this, this actual likelihood. And here, what we did is we did it for, like I said, a bunch of uh, data sets uh, simulated. And the idea is to include uh, in our simulation some LIV delay or not to check if we can reconstruct it. And this is what we did. And this is first uh, plots of uh, our results. And this is the calibration of the analysis. Here it's for agents. So it's the three source I mentioned before. So it's Mark Ryan 501, PK2055, and PG1553. And what we do is that we, sorry, control that the injected delay is, is uh, match the reconstructed one. And so you have injected delays, reconstructed one, and you can see that they, they match pretty well. You have like here the result of the fitting parameters, and well, it should be close to a slope one. It's not perfect. There is always some, like, some bias and some, uh, uh, well, there is many things going on in this, but then, well, you can measure it with this uh, simulation, and then you can take it into account on the analysis of your data. And you can see it's pretty nice, the, the alignment for AGNs. For pulsars, we have the, the crab seen by Magic, the crab seen by Veritas, and the Vela pulsar seen by S. And well, you can also see similar uh, uh, calibration plot nicely uh, aligning. And coming to the GRB, uh, this one is 
or the is like okay the plot the plot is not the right one i have no idea why uh okay why is it am i seeing wrong well the error should be more asymmetric than that okay never mind well in the GRB, well actually i don't know why i don't see it but okay there are more uh asymmetric than for the other sources and well actually the reason for that is the actual light curve so this this light kind of light curve this polo is really asymmetric i mean the flux is much much higher and there's like two orders magnitude between the beginning of observation and the end of the observation so you get this, this kind of, of plot and well what we did is then we combine all of them uh these simulations for all these sources and we checked and we get this uh, nice plot uh, once again and well, we, we have similar calibration uh, plots for uh, the, the other scenario, the DSR one, and for the capital case, of course, and they, they all be a normally. Do you start Ah, right. Okay, okay. I see, I see, I see. Okay, it's a PDF display problem, something like that. Okay, that should be like an uncertainty around. Okay. And, <laughs> okay. Well, ah, okay, okay, okay. Well, anyway, I, I'm reaching the end probably in five minutes, something like that. But we have time for this question and maybe it's time to, to get the right plot. Okay, so yes, so this actually is a statistical error. See if I know what Tomislav says, and there should be like some uh, 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 over, uh, well, sorry, this is the, yeah, this is a statistical error, and we should have the one sigma confidence interval around this, and we don't see it for some reason. But okay, uh, so if I go back slightly, sorry, if I go back slightly for the AGN, so this one sigma error region will be like 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 this, more or less, like will be like I don't know five times the, the width of this one around the, the result, but still uh, well aligned. And similar for pulsars and for the AG, uh, the GRB actually what you would see is will be smaller here and will be get larger here, no? It's kind of uh, delta shape. And this is because of the asymmetry of the light curve. You get some asymmetry here in your in your uh, reconstruction, but it's well under control. That that's the main message. And so we have similar plots for all these other scenarios and for that big case. And so once we we know that we have the, the method under control, we go back to let's say one last very important point. When you do uh, this kind of uh, experimental measurements, is the systematic uncertainties. There are a bunch of them. And let me cite a few, since we went in through details, uh, through many of these steps. Uh, so there is a limited low energy statistics uh, used to build the template. No, I said we use low energy events to build the template. This, these have some statistics, limited one, yes. You, you do it separately for each source because each source. Yes, and not, not only each instrument, each instrument and sources. Because one engine flare is not the same as a GRB. Yeah, yes, but instrument as well, yes. Yeah, because they don't have the same effective area, not the same migration matrix, not the same, all these things. So you need, for each observation, let's say each target, you need this. So it's target, so per source, per instrument. Sorry, and then you combine all the like you just. So this is this this part. So this is for one target. So you get this all these PDF, all these things, one target, and then you sum all these like you know you have target one plus target two plus target three, like you for target one plus like you for target two, and with, with the same very important the same eta parameter. No, that's the key thing is that you get the same LIV, let's say parameter to constrain in all of them. Sorry. So back to the to these uh, systematic uncertainties. So so when you split your, your sample, we 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 only have as many events as we detected. So we have a limited statistics. So this includes some Poisson fluctuations, and okay, this can affect your results. So this introduces some systematic in, in the results. Uh, I was talking about the polar law, the spectral polar law of the detected target. Uh, well, this one you can modelize in general with some polar law index. And there is some uncertainty on this parameter that, that, you, that you actually measure and you can well, take it into account. 
uh, you have the background and signal proportion. This can vary a lot from source to source. Uh, like a GRB is a very strong signal, so it's a clean one with small amount of background. But for a pulsar, it's completely the opposite. The nebula that is around, or if it's not a cramp pulsar, there is still some over uh, emission around it. So there is like a huge background of only a small signal. And okay, this you also have some uncertainty uh, measurement on, on this ratio. Uh, the energy scale, I didn't talk about it before, but well, with these simulations with two energy and reconstructed energy, actually this two energy, there is also some uncertainty there because we don't cannot modelize perfectly the atmosphere and all these things. So the absolute scale of the Cherikov telescope is not known. So there is some uncertainty there. Usually we quote it around 15%. There is some uncertainty on the redshift, so the distance of the source, which should affect uh, your results. And all, all these things you can very cleanly and properly take into account. And the way to do it is to add simply nuisance parameter to the likelihood. So all of these parameters would have some uh, PDF of their own, and you can add it as a nuisance parameter to the likelihood. And the idea of doing this is that you get uh, your final results or limits. They will be less constraining, but they, well, the, what why we do it is because they will be more robust. Because, well, more robust because you take into account actually all the limitation of your instrument. They will not be overestimated because when you neglect them, then of course you, you overestimate your, the, the capacity of your instruments. And what is very important when you do combination of multi instruments, the, you are really closer to the real performance of each instruments. And Magic S and Veritas are all slightly different. And if you don't take this to account, I mean, you, you don't really combine properly. No, you need all of these things are slightly different depending on the target and the instruments. And so it's extremely important to take this into account to have, let's say, the, the, the most fair combination possible. And okay, now we have all of this under control. I can show you some, some results. So here you can see the list of sources and here the, the, the quantum and gravity scale that we try to constrain. Uh, we have only lower energies and here you can see the, the combination. So let me highlight a few things. So you can see the uh, JNP is this Chacon and Piran uh, 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 modelization of the distance. You have the DSR one, and you, you can see one thing here is that DSR one is systematically lower than the than the Jacob and Piran one, and this can be relevant, in, for instance, for a few sources like uh, PKS twenty one fifty five or the GRB or the combined AGNs, which are like at the limit of the Planck scale, which is highlighted by this dotted line. And so, for Jacob and Piran, you are slightly above the Planck scale, and if you look at the DSR scenario, you are below. So clearly, this. I mean, having uh, this uh, distance uh, uh, parameter influence your, your final limits. And so this, well, this is where I turn to our theoretician friends. This is an important parameter to, to know how to describe. Um, and the more scenario you get, the more scenario we, we can test, of course. But this will affect the, the conclusion. Uh, another thing you can see is between uh, the results, including only statistics, and the one including the systematics that I just described, you can see that the results with the systematic are always uh, below. And this is for the reason I gave. They are less sensitive, but they are more robust. And well, you can see here clearly that okay, different sources have different limits. And when you try to combine, for instance, agent and pulsars, actually it's it's uh, close to the agent results, but you use the improvement. Then you can add the, the GRB and the pulsars, and you get something close to the GRB, but slightly higher. Same for the AGNs, and then the whole combined. And this is one important feature of this combined likelihood that is it's often dominated by, by the strongest source. And it's even more true if the strongest source is, let's say, almost, well, not almost, but half another magnitude or one other magnitude above the rest. So this has a strong effect on the combination. But if you had like the closer sources, you would better see the, the improvement. But everything else that we said, the fact that we use different sources, different uh, and achieved all these things still makes the analysis more robust and make this kind of study uh, worth it. And this is why we, we do it. Another plot uh, to highlight a bit more the, the difference between the, the results that, that, that we get here um, in, in blue and yellow, and next to it, the one published by S Magic and Veritas using the data, not, not the, our simulations. And you can always see this. So again, you can see this effect between uh, statistics and systematics, you get lower results. And the publication results are actually often in between. And well, you can clearly see the effect of uh, uh, the, the systematics and they can bring us lower, they are more robust. This is because we are doing LIV with Chankov telescopes since more than 15 years and the analysis just kept improving in the last 15 years. It's the same analysis, is, uh, today is not the same analysis as 15 years ago, that's the main reason. 
And the last thing is this uh, closer comparison between uh, the limits obtained with the Jacobin Piran and the DSR uh, modelization. And so you a few things to, to notice. At the low uh, redshift, uh, actually for the pulsar, so we don't even use uh, redshift. We use the Euclidean distance, and you can well, you cannot see the the blue points because they are the same. It's a nice cross check of everything working fine, and then you go to higher distances, and you can clearly see the the, the, the difference between the two and the DSR uh, providing let's say uh, lower importance to the distance and low, lower limits. And the thing I would like you to to notice on on this plot. Is that they well? Of course, it goes lower, but it also gives, like we said before, more weight to the other sources. Because, for instance, PKS 2155 is less affected because it's uh, closer to us, while those ones are more affected. So, if the GRB goes lower and PKS basically doesn't change much, then the relative weight of both source change, and the combined analysis, you know, uh, of these two sources and all the rest makes even more sense. And I think uh, this was the last result I wanted to show you. Uh, so what we would like you to take away is that, okay, we have this uh, LIV combination code, it's now operational and tested and validated on simulations. So, well, as you can see, we have everything under control with this nice calibration plot. We also have these systematic uncertainties uh, uh, carefully assessed, and we have them in the like, analysis and they allow us to draw more robust uh, limits. Uh, as of now, the, the current combined limit is dominated by a single strong source, the GRB 19014C. But okay, this is only hope for the future. We need more GRBs. And once we get uh, all these new GRBs at the same strength for higher, let's say, than GRB 19014C, then we get even better limits. And then this, this I just discussed, this uh, combined limits uh, affected by the dependence of the, of the distance. You get these two modelization, and okay, the Jacobin Piran gives better limit than DSR large redshift, well, which, which is just the result of uh, our Jacobin Piran is built. And but it's important for our limits because it can it can change the conclusion if you compare to a single energy like the Planck scale. And then this uh, DSR for us it's very well it's a, it's actually a nice one because well since the GRB is more affected because it's further then more sources have a different weight, and then the combined limit makes uh, more sense depending on the scenario. And of course, the last uh, step, next, the next step, and last step, at least for now, would be now to combine the data. I, I recall it was all uh, uh, based on Monte Carlo and testing the method, and now we, we need to do this with the real data to, to see what we get. And I think that's it. Thank you for your attention, and we can continue to discuss on all these things. I'll try to be short enough. So Daniel, thank you very much for that time for discussion and questions. Is there anyone that would like to speak? Yeah, I have a question. Every time I see this this type of uh, constraint from gamma rays, I wonder how you actually do the propagation part of the gamma rays because and also the combination of the source, because the source can have a maximum energy that is slightly higher. Then it can produce pairs at slightly higher energies. And you can have, for example, second generation photons from inverse Compton scattering. And this is not considered in the analysis. So no. this, uh, this is a normal effect that certainly happens at second order and might mask the uh, Lorentz invariance constraint. I totally agree what you said, but it's not taken into account, yes, right, in the, in the analysis. It's something we have been talking about it for years, but we lack the, let's say, the manpower, the time and to, to do it. But it's certainly something we should we should do, this, this kind of effects. Uh, this, do you have any, just an intuition of uh, whether this effect is it's important or not? <laughs> uh, <laughs> No, I, on, on this kind of topic, my intuition, I would not trust it. But Thomas Lafont to, to answer. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank and so far, all the results are consistent with not seeing the effect. So uh, there is no significant halo around the AGNs. And I, I 
at least one study was published with uh, Fermi and Lutz. So, uh, let's say high energy gamma rays uh, uh, or up to 100 GV or so. And there was there was also a study by Hess, Julian. Yes, there is there is one by S ten years ago. Yes. Uh, also, uh, but this ELO thing is really difficult. Uh, yes, it's difficult to see because we have this uh, point spread function that is smudging things, and then it's difficult to resolve um, the emission from from the source itself from the surrounding. I think it, so yeah the, you were mentioning the halos but the halos just come up if you have the magnetic fields in the absence of magnetic fields you can still have the second order effect you can have a first generation uh, per production and then if the uh, source energy is high enough this can produce an electron inverse quantum and then this photon is still TV, it still has a TV energy and it still can inverse Compton. So you have a second generation uh, inverse uh, uh, photons there and this probably contributes to the, uh, to the propagation effect and this is not taken into account with the modeling when you do this type of exponential uh, EBL absorption kind of fit, which is very common. So that's why I'm asking because I never see this type of study and you don't need the halos, the magnetic fields to see that. Of course, if you have magnetic fields, things are even worse because uh, magnetic fields will screw up everything. So, so, so your idea is to add some gamma conversion to electron positron, then those one can emit more gamma rays. And then because the travel time of the electron positron will be slower than the actual photons, it will induce some delay and should be taken into account than it is. Okay, and this is not actually done, at least in terms of uh, telescope uh, LIV analysis. And yes, we are aware of this, but it, I don't want to say it's impossible to modelize and to do analysis, but it will be pretty tough. And okay, so far we are working on the combination, but it, I would say it's now to-do list for the next 10 years, let's say. <laughs> and let's see when we can do it. Just one more addition. I was talking about Halo as an example of these different effects that can happen. And this one, this is another one. I, I think it probably happens just the influence is very minor. Wouldn't be is uh, something that uh, is not relevant once you have access to several redshift, uh, several sources at different redshifts. Because would it be redshift dependent? No, I guess. So if you were looking at different sources at different redshifts, you, you, I, I, you are saying it, it's not redshift dependent, this effect. Yeah, okay, then for us it would. Have access to many sources at different redshifts. Okay. Okay, then we can disentangle can for the reason I explained, and then we, we can find it like the, let's say, we bought it. Okay, that's a good point. And, then and related it. to this, uh, none of the intrinsic effects uh, are expected to be redshift dependent, uh, or, or are they? Another effect that is redshift dependent. Yeah, is there any other effect that would be redshift dependent? And uh, not to my up? knowledge. Well, it, if it's redshift dependent, it's... it's it's distance dependent, so it's propagation somehow. So it's not intrinsic. For us, that's the most important thing, no? Because, well, we know the sources, we analyze them, let's say, regular basis, AGN, uh, full start of these things. And we know that they have different mechanisms. Well, even if at the core, it can be the same acceleration mechanism, they have different structures. And so they have different, let's say, time scale to accelerate those particular different energies. So for us, that's the most worrying effect that we try to get rid by looking at that. And so for us, anything that is uh, redshift dependent, it's, it's linked to propagation. So for, for now, we modelize it with LIV, but if there is a concurrent effect that I'm not aware of, but maybe, maybe you know some, uh, then we might try to explain. If one day we see some delay with, with linked to the propagation, that the redshift, we, we might associate it to, to another cause than LIV. It doesn't have to be LIV, but uh, okay. So far, we are looking for that one. It, it, it's on linear and quadratic dependence of, of of the delay, that, that's it. If we see something, we can associate it to something else in the background. This, we, we use this kind of formula as effective formulas to describe our samples. The, 
we, we actually have very little uh, theory behind uh, this, this formula. So uh, I think there was a question from uh, online participants. They can also ask questions if they want. So you just raise your hands. Okay, for the moment, lower its hand. So is there any other question or comment? Anyone that would like to say something or? So it's all clear now. Experimental. <laughs> Can I just make a, a quick one? No, no. You know what, from a theory side of uh, of you, because in, in principle, Lorentz invariance and Lorentz violation can be many things. So can we distinguish, I mean, if you find a Lorentz uh, uh, violation, for instance, can we distinguish from uh, what sector it is, I mean, on you see what I mean? I mean, it can be you can violate it in various under rotation or other boost, or, or or you can have preferred frame effects or whatever. So, in, in principle, what kind of lower invariance violation you are going to see? So, here what we see is really is delays of photons depending on their energy, no? And what is it? Assuming or being confident enough that the intrinsic effect doesn't reproduce this kind of effect by combining different sources. That, that's what we can provide you if we see it one day. It's photons with well, well with what we think is confident delays in our time. And then I'm not on the theory side, on theory side, sorry, but uh, I'm I'm pretty sure more than one effect, more than one, let's say, a description of this of this effect can be done on the theory exactly. side. There is, and then you would need to provide us different uh, exactly. outcomes, more fine tune, let's say more fine-tuned dependence on the energy or more fine-tuned dependence on the distance, these kind of things, to start this entangle. And then it will all, all be limited by, well, the samples that we have and the, and the precision that we have with the measurement. But uh, no, so far, we just look for this, let's say, generic effect. And then if we see it, we can start let's say, looking at smaller differences you know, on the theory side and looking for them uh, in the data. So that would be the plan, but uh, yeah. Very good. So is there any other comment or question? So if not, let's thank Daniel again. We can now proceed with the next speaker is Giacomo here. So the next speaker is Giacomo Rosati, and he will talk on testing curvature induced in vacuum dispersion with gamma ray burst. Thank you. And uh, we'll talk after this very interesting talk by Daniel, which was very precise. So I apologize if some parts of my talk will be much longer for from the experimental side. Um, so, in this talk, uh, I will present the, this uh, work that I've done together with uh, Giovanni Amenino Camelia and Susanna Bedic, where we essentially propose, uh, uh, well, we test a toy model where for, for studying time delays associated with gamma ray bars, where uh, we essentially investigate a feature such that the effect of time delay is triggered by space time curvature. So it essentially, I, it would be clear, clear after, but we were interesting in, in uh, looking how does it work if you have a model of time delay associated with 
violation or deformation of symmetries where the effect disappears when when you are the curvature is, is neglected so it disappears closer closer to 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 the to the to us okay so some uh, small motivation well um, which i think it's unnecessary but just let me go quickly through it so it arises uh, the idea is that from fundamental theories of quantum gravity some non-trivial structures affect space-time at the, at the Planck length and that and this can be associated to uh, an energy scale which is the Planck scale and particularly interesting is, is the possibility that this affect uh, measure, measurements uh, in a way so that characterizes a maximum uh, reachable energy scale uh, that that uh, essentially is associated to a minimum possible length under which you cannot perform your measurement. And even more uh, interestingly for, for phenomenology is, is the possibility that this uh, idea, this, this characterizes a modification of the special relation that describes the propagation of point particles. So that the speed of particles becomes energy dependent and uh, energy dependent is of course triggered by the, by the Planck length. So in the literature, this has, this has been studied essentially, well, mostly in two different scenarios, roughly. One is where this, this modification of the kinematical laws uh, breaks some of the symmetries of, of the relativistic picture. And the other alternative uh, picture is where the, the relativistic symmetries are still uh, the relativistic principle is, is still ba valid, but the, the, relativistic, the transformation laws between observer are, are modified. And this is the DSR perspective. And, but most importantly for phenomenology is that in both of these scenarios, essentially one looks for a correlation between the energy of, 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 the, of the particle and the, the time delay of, uh, of observations. So, it was proposed essentially, uh, I think in, in, the, in the paper was, was this or around this time, that gamma ray bars could provide a suitable source for this kind of, of, uh, of analysis uh, by Aminio Cameli, Alice Mavromatos, and Anopoulos Sarkar. And essentially this is because if you, if you consider to in schematically two different par two particles of different energy a low energy particle and a high energy particle which are emitted simultaneously from a distant source then the time of propagation acts as an amplifier of the tiny Planckian effect that characterizes time delay and so for gamma ray bars where for some of them the time of propagation is of cosmolog cosmological scale up to well in case of redshift of of uh, around one up to 10 to 17 seconds then uh, considering the, the the energy scales involving the the most high energetic photons respect to the low energy ones then the effort could be within the reach of, of sensibility of, of, of observation even for uh, eta which is the parameter that that characterizes uh, that test has to be estimated and constrained by observation for when it is closer to one, then the effect is, is thought to be at the Planck scale. And where it is uh, zero, the effect is, is uh, absent. So, um, so then uh, this requires, of course, to, to, to generalize the, the, the theoretical models in order to include the effect of of uh, cosmological expansion into into the game and uh, the formula that was used so far in the literature is the one that after some a series of works was assessed in this in this, in this work by Jacob Piran but for, before it was proposed by Ellis and Mavromatos and others and it was refined in this paper and this distance factor takes this essentially this expression in terms of the, of the redshift okay this is the distance factor that and replaces the time of travel in the in the formula for time delay 
uh, well, of course, the, the first evidence that this could lead to, to quantum gravity phenomenology was provided by the bound uh, uh, obtained by this uh, observation of, of 090510 by, by Fermi in 2009, where essentially uh, they observed a high energy photon that was emitted basically simultaneously to the low energy peak of, of, of the spectrum. And this allowed to show that you can't, you, you are able to constrain this observation at up to, pla up to Planck length. This was the, the, the first up to Planck scale. This was the first example of, of uh, well, one of the strongest evidence that quantum gravity phenomenology was, was viable through, through this kind of analysis. Okay. So uh, this, essentially this kind of bound is obtained by, by comparing the arrival time of the high energy photon respect to the low energy, low energy peak of the, of the burst, okay? And what one can do uh, disregarding this single data or, uh, is, to, is to take uh, treat testing backward dispersion statistically by considering the, this data as one among uh, many, uh, many, many other, uh, the other available um, uh, signal of, 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 this, of, this, of this kind. And this kind of analysis was proposed by my collaborator in, in, in uh, some years ago in this set series of paper. And then we have studied uh, again this kind of analysis statistically in combination also with a similar analysis uh, with uh, astrophysical neutrinos in this, in this paper, together with Giacomo D'Amico and Nicola Lore, and of course, Amenio Camellia. And essentially, uh, the, um, the, we, we consider a set of gamma ray bars that were suitable essentially for, for this kind of analysis, so that uh, satisfied the selection criteria for performing this kind of studies and so that they were um, uh, characterized by some of the, of the single photons uh, with energy greater than, observed energy greater than 40 uh, GB. And then this is the, the phenological model that we have studied. So in, the, in this model, you, you, you see that we uh, take also into account, as proposed by the Maman collaborator, the presence of essentially intrinsic, intrinsic time lag by adding this, this, this time of offset in the, in the, in the formula, which, is, uh, which we treated, well, in, in this case, as, as, you, as you may ask later, this is treated uh, as a universal time of offset uh, for, for, all the, for, the, for all the gamma ray bars. And uh, we rescale the energy, the observed energy uh, with this, this distance function depending on the redshift in order to have a linear, a linear equation to, to fit, okay? So this is, this is the phenological model. And the uh, delta t, the time, the time delay that we, that we take for our data is the time of observation different between the energetic photons and the low energy peak uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the signal of the GRB, okay? So this is, this is the setup. And here I, uh, I plot the, the time delay against the, the, this rescaled energy. And you see that uh, considering uh, these avail the available data that we had in 2017, essentially out eight of, of the 11, the old set of, of data actually uh, seem to fit uh, uh, to, to agree with 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 a, with a common value of, of the of the scale of the systematic uh, time delay effect and the same time of uh, with a very high correlation and we also estimated what we denoted as false alarm probability so which just means that we have randomized we we have simulated the background to see how often this could happen by randomizing the, the, the times of, uh, of all, the, all, the, all the data that we had. And we, we, have, uh, derived that the, we have estimated that this happens only in 1% of, of cases. So it, it, 
strengthen a little bit the, the indication that it is, it is it was worth to study this, this kind of effort. Um, so uh, in our paper here in combination with neutrino, it was also, well, quite impressive that a similar analysis, even with a lot of caveats that we perform with, with astrophysical neutrinos, seem to suggest that a similar effort seems to be compatible for both kind of sources ranging for uh, energy um, range of, of, of four orders of, of, of magnitude. Okay. So this is, this is what was done until, 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 uh, until uh, with, with Jacob and Piran formula, essentially. And um, well, essentially the Jacob Piran formula is, as I, as I said at the beginning, is assumed to be valid when quantum gravity effects are present, even in absence of, of space and curvature, okay? So the, 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 the distance formula that implement in the, in the, in the, in the scheme, when the curvature goes to zero, so essentially when the redshift is very low, it still, it, it gives you essentially one, uh, or, or just the time of, of propagation, okay? It is, the, the effect is still there. However, some theoretical considerations suggest that it may be likely that uh, quantum gravity effects are triggered by curvature. And particularly, it is, it is interesting the possibility that the interplay between cosmological constant and Planck scale characterizes the effect. And I cite here a work by Rovelli and Bianchi where they uh, propose a suggestive uh, interpretation where essentially the cosmological horizon combines with the Planck length in such a way that the two effects are entangled together. And uh, well, formally this leads at least, at a, seems to lead to, to a kind of, of modification of, of, of the models of the type that is usually called in this, in this kind of literature of Q the sitter, where the deformation parameter is indeed a combination of the Planck land and the cosmological constant. And it was also noticed in, in a previous study where how essentially if you start from this Q the sitter kind of modification of kinematical laws of relativity, and you try to disentangle the effect of space of cosmological constant, space and curvature for, from the Planck land and the quantum gravity effect, it, it, it requires a uh, sizable fine tuning involving renormalization of generators, of, of symmetry generators, to have an effect that doesn't disappear uh, when, when lambda leads to zero. Okay. So, they, so for, for those who are on the field to obtain kappa one carré from Q the sitter, uh, it appears that to disentangle the, 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 the to, to have a, a, a framework where you have kappa upon carré when lambda goes to zero requires some fine tuning of, of the generators. This was at least what was suggested starting from an, uh, studies of, of uh, 3D quantum gravity and, and something related to this. And I also mentioned some recent paper where uh, Borovitz, Ascari and Paco study obtain a similar result in the context of a non-commutative differential geometry, where they study Kappa Minkowski and Friedman Roberts Walker scenario. So here are the theoretical motivation for trying to study a toy model where you have an effect that essentially combines the cosmological scale and the Planck scale in such a way that the effects disappear when, when lambda goes to zero. Uh, which we denote as curvature induced uh, scenario in this paper. And so strictly speaking, uh, they are characterized by the fact that in vacuum dispersion is not present in the flat, even if no commutative limit, but only when space and curvature is significant. Well, phenomenologically, it seem, may seem hopeless because you may expect to have a double suppression due to the double scale, the Planck scale or, or the inverse of the Planck energy and, and the curvature or cosmological constant scale. However, it turns out that 
lambda, the cosmological scale, or the square root of lambda, actually, is always appears in the formulas multiplied by the distance traveled by the particle. So that the, the smallness of, of, of the curvature effect is compensated by the distance traveled by the particle. And since the, for the relevant phenomenology, the, uh, the distance is cosmological, then it compensates the, the suppression. So let me start by, by, by let me now describe the, this toy model that we, we have studied for this preliminary, preliminary analysis. And let me first describe shortly again the Jacob Piran formula to see what is the difference with our, with our formula. From the, in, the, in the Lorentz invariance violation scenario, you can start from a modified dispersion relation when essentially the modification term appears as the ratio between the momentum the, uh, of the particle and the scale factor here for prima robles of worker scenario essentially. Okay. And this leads one can one can show to a time delay where the distance factor is, is essentially this, which is the one that I, that I wrote in some slide before. So if you start from this special relation where the scale factor appears here in this deformation term, you obtain this prediction for the time delay where this is the behavior uh, in terms of the redshift. Now uh, we are looking for alternative. Okay. Yeah, the sorry. Zero. Yes. yes, yes. This is the present. This is uh, the yes, the cosmological parameters of the lambda TDM model. So uh, we uh, essentially consider alternative to this formula. Actually, we did it some years ago in this paper with Antonino Marciano and Marco Matassa and Melino Camellia, where we consider both generalization of, of the Jacob Piran uh, formula from, from the Lorentz Bayan perspective and from the DSR obtaining a generalization of time delay starting from different dispersion relation. And essentially, and I also mentioned these, these, these other papers also by Piran and Rodriguez Martinez and this, this also recent paper by Christian Pfeiffer where he also considers some alternatives to, to Jacob and Piran formula. But essentially the difference, uh, at least in the Lorentz invariance violation case is in the form in, in the in the in the position in the in the way the scale factor characterizes the the modification terms in the in the in the in the dispersion relation, and in particular we focus on, on on a specific case where we have this parameter different from zero here, and this is associated to a dispersion relation where. Essentially, the scale factor instead of having to uh, be into the denominator of, of the momentum is, is, is multiplying the momentum. Okay. And so this is the, the, the alternative form, formula. And actually, what we did, we combined the two, considering essentially this, this combination of, of, of these two, these two possible dispersion relations. And this is this is the starting point of, of our toy model. For, for, the, for this analysis. Yes. It is an ansatz in the sense that, uh, uh, well, we, 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 we studied in detail in, in this paper, but essentially also, also the, this is an ansatz, Jacob and Piran one. So the, the... Yes. Yes, but there is no reason why you should not have another time dependence on the on the on the additional four term there. No, it's, it's inspired by, by this, but there is no. So the, the, actually, if you see essentially the paper, they already, they already of Piran and Rodriguez Martinez here, they already consider the possibility that to have a different dependence on the scale factor. Of course, this is, well, we, we, we study in, the, in, in this paper, we study the, the fact that this, this formula is, has some, some peculiar 
properties that makes it rather solid from some point of view, but just conceptual, because essentially, well, if I can tell just shortly, the, the Jacob and Pion formula is in, in the leave scenario, but also in the design sense, some sense is, is a formula that doesn't affect translational symmetry in the, in the DSR limit. So in a sense, it just breaks Lorentz symmetry when you, when you go in the, DSR, in the, the sitter limit. So when, when the scale factor is not the full Freeman Roberts work, but you have all the symmetries, this position of the scale factor is the one that doesn't break translational symmetry, but just Lorentz. Okay. But then in FRW, you don't have translational symmetry, so it's a bit more ad hoc, this, this uh, choice. But nevertheless, <coughs> we are interested just in the phenomenological possibility. So apart from, from the motivation, uh, we just pick up this toy model and, and essentially, as I show here, if we combine these two, these two, um, these two formulas here, we obtain a modified dispersion relation that leads to a velocity of a particle where essentially the, uh, you, you see from, from this that essentially the effect of modification of the speed of particle uh, is triggered by, by a combination of these parameters such that if you, if you, if you, if you fix lambda prime equal to minus lambda, the effect is completely triggered by, by curvature in the sense that H0 here, here is basically the, the, the Hubble parameter now, but for, for small times, but essentially this means that if we, if we, if we, if the, the expansion contribution curvature goes to zero, then the effect disappears. So it doesn't survive as, as on the contrary, uh, the, the Jacob Pirat formula or the um, usual DSR formula are, okay. It disappears when, when, when uh, sources are, are, are closer so that you can neglect curvature, okay. This is the, the property. Um, well, this is the time delay that you obtain and for the choice, of lambda prime equal to minus lambda is it reduces to this to this to this distance factor. So this is the distance factor that we want uh, uh, to use to replace the Jacob Piran distance factor in, in in the in the in the model in the phenological model. Okay. Uh, so this is my last slide, and we um, consider essentially the set of photons which are relevant for which were, were relevant for this kind of analysis, which are these 11, 11 photons, gamma ray bars photons with energy at emission greater than 40 GV. And um, essentially that was studied in these in this papers by Ma and then in our paper here. So let me first show in this, in this plot here, what happens when you, when you plot uh, the, Time delay, but taking it minus the, the time of offset, so uh, modulus the time of offset here against the, the rash heat of the source to, to see what, what is going to happen. So for the Jacob Piran formula, so the, 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 the scenario that was studied before in the literature, so not the curvature induced scenario, you see that essentially, the, as, as I say, it's taking into account of, of the, you know, universal value for the time of offset, you see that what happens is that essentially three of the 11 photons that are considered here do not fit the phenomenological model. And while the other actually, as I was saying before, seems to fit quite nicely the, the, the model within uncertainties. And of these three photons, we have this, 090902b photon that is actually uh, exposes a larger delay. So it could be explained to be associated to a later peak or some intrinsic effect of emission. We have this other, four, uh, other uh, point here, which is associated to a photon from 
080916, which is a huge Rashid uh, greater than four and has a very large uncertainty. So we, we cannot really, so it is, the, the, the most challenging data in this analysis apart from, 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 from these two is again, this 090510 because it is at a smaller delay and it exposes a smaller delay, so it cannot be explained with, with emission from, from a possible later process. Uh, and it has a very small uncertainty, okay? So this is the most challenging data for the Jacob Piran formula, at least at this, at this level of, of analysis. Uh, so let, let, let me show now what happens with this toy model for curvature induced uh, scenario. And essentially what happens as one could have expected essentially is that the, the, the behavior, so the, the model is milder uh, when, when the ref sheet is, is, is small. So when, when the SARS source is, is much closer to, to us. And the first thing to notice is that there is no actual overall suppression of the effects due to curvature as one may have expected. So the data which are at Rashid, high Rashid are taken into account uh, well fitted by, by, by the model. So it, it is not suppressed over the whole range of redshift. Okay, is the first, the first observation. The second is, this, this that I was mentioning that you have much weaker in backward dispersion for, for small redshift. And this is such that it handles quite well the 090510 data in uh, respect to the, to the other. Okay, so this is, this is, this is what makes interesting this, this kind of, of, uh, of model. Of course, uh, it may be that, that this feature that we have uh, presented here will fade away when one considers more data, more refined analysis. However, on one side, we have shown that phenomenology of curvature induced in vacuum dispersion is also viable. So it, it, considering a model which may be inspired by something like QDC, where the effect is, is triggered by both cosmological constant and L Planck, uh, so that it disappears when lambda goes to zero, it, it is interesting for phenomenology, okay? And of course, this is just a toy model, but we expect that some of the fe features that are exposed in this model should be still present once one is able to, to, to construct a more, more interesting, at least from the theoretical point of view model that uh, characterizes by, by curvature induced um, scenario. Okay, and this is, this is all, thank you. So the formula you proposed, um, you that it is valid to both for the Lorentz infinite relation scenario and from uh, also for a for a DSR scenario. No, this 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 one we is only valid for for uh, the Lorentz variance violation scenario. Uh -huh. We we have actually we have also something for the DSR, but we didn't uh, we didn't see the. Uh, published and we are working mm -hmm. on it. Thanks. So we have a similar model, but with some similar characteristics, but these were much simpler to, to, to show, okay? Because you don't have relative locality and all this stuff. Yeah, so, yeah, so this spot. Yes. Um, so I, I just have a question about the sample of GRBs that you are using. Yes. So could you tell us uh, how many of these GRBs are long GRBs and how many are short GRBs? So I don't remember exactly, but uh, I think like 30% of them are short. Okay. Like that. The reason I ask is that, yes. so, 
So the answer is that you don't really know, right? <laughs> yes, yeah. Uh, and the problem is that we know for years that there are very different behaviors between short GRBs and long GRBs as far as the delays are concerned. So short GRBs do not show any significant, uh, let's say, intrinsic delays, while we know that there are intrinsic delays in long GRBs. Mm -hmm. So and that's the same remark I, uh, I have already done for the previous results that you shown at the beginning of, the, of, of, of your talk. The, the yeah. problem is always the same. And um, so the, what I would do is I would clearly separate the, the, the two populations of GRBs because basically you cannot conclude on the same behavior with these two very different populations. Yes. Of course, you will have much more, uh, much less, sorry, much less objects uh, to to uh, to put on your plot because, yeah, you will divide by, I, I don't know, maybe uh, two thirds of these GRBs are, are long GRBs, I think. I don't know them by heart. I, but, uh, yes, I, I have to, I have to, to I, I don't remember at the moment. And, um, but for instance, of, of course, this is a short GRB. Yeah, so uh, the, o, o 9 or 5 10 yeah. is really a, a peculiar case. Yeah. It's very short, very bright. So, yeah, so this one is clearly a short GRB. Yes. Yeah. We know. And, um, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's really something that, that, that should be done uh, very uh, each time you or others, huh? not, not just you, but uh, put some, some, some GRBs like this uh, in, in, a, in a group of sources where they try to find some colorations, etc. You should really, so you and the others yes, yes. should really uh, study the, the sample of sources that you use from, from the start. These DRBs, are they long, are they short, are they bright, are they dim? Uh, do, we, do, we, do they show any uh, peculiar uh, characteristics as far as their uh, 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 energy or uh, uh, afterglow are, uh, is con are concerned? That, that's really something I think is missing in all these uh, papers showing correlations. Yes. The, the other point is that, okay, you use, uh, I don't remember, you use the peak of the low energy emission yes. as a reference. So what I would suggest here is try another way to compute the delays. Mm -hmm. Because you use this as a reference, but maybe, yes. maybe there is some strange effects uh, that that could arise, and it should be compensated by 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 a, a large population of objects. If you, but but the population there is not so large, right? So yeah, so yeah, I, I, I agree. I, for instance, you could show, you could try to see what happens if you see the candidates but to the trigger time or, but but uh, so the. the yeah. yeah so, so again, you, you are talking about the trigger time, but for me, the trigger time is really some, something uh, which is dictated by the hardware. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you compare really uh, light curves at low energies mm -hmm. and high energies, and you do something like we do with the, with, with the likelihood uh, analysis, then these kind of uh, this kind of hardware effects just disappear. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. We choose the, the low energy peak uh, as as a as a reference in this case, but I I I, I mean I, I'm aware of, of the peculiarity of all, of all these different points respect to the to the GRBs, but the fact is that in order to to have at least uh, an indication for an, this is, this is has to be taken not as, not as a rigorous analysis, but just possible direction for studying. Uh, and anyways, anyways, such kind of studies is always interesting to... Uh, no, no, what, what I want to say is that the problem here is that even with these very bold assumptions that we made, uh, we have only 11 points. So yeah, there's, sure. there's no way of... of, uh, of, uh, of uh, yeah, otherwise, we end up with, with having uh, just one point for each category. So 
it's not it's, possible to do yeah it's interesting in a way but uh, just it must be taken just as an indication not not of course not um I, I obviously share Julien's concerns, uh, but I also agree that uh, this is an interesting, as a motivation to go to do a more in-depth study. Uh, but uh, so on that note, I was wondering, do you have somewhere both of these time delays shown at the same time? Because one is pale and I would really like to compare them. Sorry, sorry, can you? Can you... Uh, these two uh, expressions for uh, for time delays, do you have them uh, somewhere on the same slide? So, ah, <laughs> yes, exactly. ah, sorry. Yes, here. So, I guess so, this, this one and this one. Okay, so we have. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, personally, I would love to see a plot with these two depending on, on redshift or something like that. So just to compare uh, what we can expect from one expression and the other. Uh, I think for us, for the analysis that we are doing, it's, it's not difficult to just plug in this second formula inside and see what we get. Uh-huh, yes. Let's say, what, what was your question then? No, I, I just wanted to see them compared. Uh, ah, okay. To see what we can expect from one and the other, and the other. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Uh, well, these are the, the the two the two distance factors. So uh, this is the the parameter to estimate. Okay. The eta. This is uh, the delta of energy, the energy shift. And this is this distance factor, it usually is denoted as D of Z. This is the Jacob Piran formula. And this is the, the new one. So, and, but the, in the limit of a small redshift, this depends on, 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 uh, on the redshift, okay, here, well. So, I think it's thank you. Is there any other question or comment? I think we should thanks, yeah. So, sorry, just to be precise, this depends on the redshift quadratically when you when you go to small redshift. And this because uh, then you have to scale it. By, by H of Z, okay, sorry, thank you. So now it's time for, for break. Yes, you, you might want to sign if you want the lunch pack, remember that there is a, there is a list there. Thank you. 